Hello everyone out there in TV land. Welcome to the 2019 edition of Visual Radio. And my guest tonight is Vikram Agarwal. Very Did nice I say it right? Yes, that was okay. right. Very nice to be here, Joe. A superb guitar player. Um, but um, my previous guest was Joe Perry from Aerosmith. <laughs> So you're the first guest of this year. Okay. I'm not sure how to follow that act, but I will try my best. Joe is an awesome guest, and we got to get him into the studio on TV because we got a lot more questions to go. I, I would send his wife the questions and because um, I was back there in the day when Aerosmith were a local band. Absolutely, yeah. And um, it was, I'll just tell you a little story. So I was at a Humble Pie concert with my best buddy, Donnie. Uh, we grew up two houses away in Somerville, and... We'd go to the concerts together. And so um, I'd been backstage at a uh, Ray Davies concert, mm -hmm. and Steve Tyler walked by, and I go, hey, Mick Jagger. And he was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm at this Humble Pie concert, and Steven's in a velour red jacket. I remember it to this day, you know, because it was a local scene, and we were all going to the con same concerts. And I'm like, I was out of line. I got to go get this guy's autograph. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I go, uh, hey, Stephen, can I get your autograph? He goes, you want my autograph? I go, yeah, I want your autograph. He goes, you want Joe Perry's? I'm like, who's, who's Joe Perry, right? <laughs> sure, I'll get Joe Perry. I just felt bad that I was like a smart ass. And uh, behind stage, you know, everyone's talking to Ray Davies and, and this guy's walking by. And they were very Rolling Stones. They were very like the Rolling Stones' first album, which is very like their first album. So, uh it was great. So Stephen, you know, they must have given autographs at the high schools, but this is probably his first legitimate autograph. Right. So um, Joe comes over, and so Stephen's putting, like, these things over his name, like this, and Joe goes, what are you doing? He goes, that's how you do it, man. <laughs> this had to be their first autograph. So <laughs> Joe's first wife, Alyssa Perry, and I were in a publicity company together. Okay. His second wife, Billy, was my graphic artist at my record label. Poor Joe, I love you. You can't get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> so Billy said, send the autograph. I made a copy and sent it. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't know where it is now, which box, but... I was just going to ask. Yeah, that would be a good thing to have now. Throw that on eBay. I mean, you know, well, <laughs> eBay doesn't like doing autographs. Yeah. But I want to talk about you, but I just thought you'd find that interesting. Absolutely. <laughs> it was a fun old days. You I know. always like hearing those stories from the old days from you. Well, I'll give you one more because this is fun. Alyssa Perry and I would go to New York, uh, and we had a client that owed us money. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of money. He wasn't paying us, right? Sure. So Alyssa's so much fun. And we're, you know, we had twin beds, obviously platonic. We're just good friends, right? Yeah. But we were in this room, and she's putting on Don Johnson's whatever it was. Hawaii. I don't forget the show, Don Johnson. He would run around without socks on. <laughs> hey, Paul, what's Don Johnson's show? Do you remember? Miami something? Miami Vice. Miami Vice, thank you. Thank you, our director, Paul Norman. So, <laughs> Alyssa goes, we're in bed. You know, she's in one bed, I'm in the other. We're watching Miami Vice. We got the menu. She goes, order up. <laughs> and I go, sure. We had room service being old. Nice. Since he'll have to pay for it anyways, he's not paying us. It was just hilarious. We had a blast. But this is the fun stuff, you know? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, Alyssa knew everyone. Um, but... We're talking about you. So I met you through big screen radio. That's right. Absolutely. Vikram. Yes. And uh, when did big screen radio start? So that started uh, probably the summer of 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so what happened was I had just moved into town um, from Colorado. Uh, so I finished up school out in Colorado and moved out here to the Boston area. What uh, college? I went to University of Colorado at Boulder. Nice. Um, yeah, good school, fun school. Cold out there. Yeah, it's chilly. I think you guys have it a little bit worse out here, though. So okay. I'm not faring too well in the winters out here. But um, yeah, so I had moved out here, and I was looking to get involved with music in some capacity. And I'd played with bands out there, but obviously I didn't have a band or a group out here. So I started looking through Craigslist, and I found an ad that uh, the singer, uh, Justin, had put into... Uh, Craigslist. They're looking for a guitar player and they listed looking for someone who's into Aerosmith, Van Halen, uh, Pantera, sort of, you know, hard rock guitar style that I was into. And I was like, this sounds great, you know. So I shot them a message and um, the next day uh, Justin phoned me up and we got to talking and I showed up at practice um, a few days later 
And he said, you got the gig. You're the new guitar player in big screen radio. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So it was a good time. Uh, we played for, I think, about a year, maybe a year and a half, sort of writing some new songs. Um, they're very into that hard rock kind of atmosphere. So I think they're a little bit distinguished in the Boston scene because of that. They sort of had more of a, a hard rock sound that was kind of reminiscent of like 70s, 80s kind of thing. And that's what I was really into and the kind of uh, guitar style that I was really into playing. And it's a great name for a band, Big Screen Radio. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, Jim Alger, my good friend, was your producer. That's right. Um, after about a year of playing together, we'd been talking about doing an album, and um, uh, Justin was also friends with Jim. And I think they had worked on something else before, and he said, why don't we just go to Jim to make the record? And I didn't know Jim, but I was like, all right, yeah, sounds good if you know the guy. And yeah, we, we went there, and we worked on the record together. Um, that was also sort of the, uh, the period when things started getting a little bit rocky in the band. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I'm still, you know, very fond of the time that we had together, the shows that we played, and uh, the album, just the making of the album, that whole process was a lot of fun. I have good memories around that. Now, I work with a guy named Joe Black. Mm -hmm. And he has a band called um, Ball and Chain. They've been around a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking 40 years, people. It was oh, like wow. the dawn of Boston rock and roll. So Joe's still a dear friend. He came over the house the other day because I was showing him Twitter. And people want to know Twitter. But the thing Joe said to me is, goes, one song, one song only. I said, that's what the Stones would do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so bands cut an album. Yeah. Two friends of mine are cutting an album with their band. Um, I won't say the band's name, but one of them is integral at the Cantab because his uh, uncle, I think, owned it. His late uncle was like one of the partners. So, you know, he's on the scene, and I'm saying, guys, don't cut eight songs. I mean, you can cut eight songs. Don't finish them. Mm -hmm. um, concentrate on one or two. Yeah. We need an album. Well, I said those exact same words to Jimmy Miller, and he was right and I was wrong, but I was too big for my britches. Yeah. Because I had to get an album out in Europe. Yeah. My third album... And so I had a contract, mm -hmm. but I didn't know. And Jimmy would shut down if he said, we should do four songs only. And I'm like, I got to get an album out. Okay. And then he would shut down. He would just, mm -hmm. you want to do, he, did, he didn't want to interfere with people. Um, an interesting way of production. Uh, the next time I went in with Jimmy, we did one song and it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's incredible because it's the, he said to me, do you like what I'm doing? And I said, no, but you're one of the greatest record producers of all time, so I'm going to shut my mouth because I can produce me any day of the week. Right, right. I got you. Do your thing. Have a party. I'm going to shut up. He loved it because bands wouldn't do that with him. Right, absolutely. Yeah, trust your producer. You know, you know what he's capable of. Take, it, take his advice. Well, six months later, it's like one of my favorite tracks I've ever done. Wow. But he put a 50s Boney Maroney riff in. I'm not into it, right? Mm -hmm. And he had the, the girls doing doo-wop, and I'm not mm -hmm. into that. And he had me do a Lou Reed vocal, and he got my vocal really where I needed it to be. Because mm -hmm. um, I listened to him. Because the first run doing the album, it was raw. He was right. You got If you have a producer, work with the producer. Don't co-produce. Let him do his thing. He had so much fun. You can just feel it. And I had Joe Perry's drummer, Joe Pett, from the third Joe Perry album. Wow. So Joe Pett's on drums, and Brian Bradley on guitar, and Carolyn Casey on bass. The great JoJo Lane on vocals, um, along with two other women, Deb Gallagher. Uh, it was 1986. Oh, but here's a fun story. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to get back to you. But yeah. this is a fun story. Yeah, yeah. So Phil Green, God bless him, who, a guest of Visual Radio, who's alive. i got to interrupt everything now because we lost a Visual Radio guest. One of my guests died today. His name is Peter Tork of the Monkees. Remember the monkeys? Yeah, absolutely. It's tragic. I read about that. Yeah, so Peter was on my show. Wow. We'll have to pull the tape out. We'll have to find it, Paul, and put Peter Talk on the air. Um, so I had um, wanted to do a Rolling Stones song called Red Bl Blood Red Wine that they had never released, that mm -hmm. Jimmy had produced, but they never released. So we bought a bootleg in New York, paid 25 bucks for it. The store saw me coming. I'm in the store with Jimmy Miller. Mm -hmm. They raised the price in the back room on me. <laughs> no one I needed it. It was his demos. He goes, you're out of your mind. Then I find the Joey Steck album for 25 cents. And um, he had produced Joey Steck. He goes, this is great. So we $25.25. We go home. I put it on. He goes, 
Oh, it's worth every penny, Joe. Thank you for buying this. <laughs> it was his old demos with the Stones. Yeah. It's called Taxile on Main Street. That's amazing. It's this great green record. Um, so we did all this practice on the band. We get in, and I start writing a new song. And Jimmy goes, I love it. I go, thank you. Because Joe Pett and Phil Green were trading drum samples. Mm -hmm. Jimmy said, calm down. <laughs> They're giving you free time. They gave me free, nine free hours. Phil wanted oh. to work with Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I'll just go. <laughs> I'm writing this song. He goes, this is great. I said, yeah, I know it too. And the band was like, what? We did all that practicing, right? But it yeah, worked. Yeah. It, it was, I felt like what the Rolling Stones felt like. They would go in and do a brand new song. Yeah. Free time. I had the luxury of working with Jimmy and getting free time from Phil. God bless you, my friend Phil. <laughs> and uh, great guitars from Swallow. So back to Vic's story. Um, before you came back in college, did you have a band out there in Colorado? I had a couple of projects that I would work with off and on. I had this project with some friends um, a r right after I graduated from high school. Um, some friends and I got together. We had this band we called the Dead Dragonfly. Nice. Um, yeah, and we just kind of worked on some covers and stuff like that. It was basically we would just go in and somebody say like, "What do, what do you want us to play?" And I, you know, brought in a Van Halen song, and somebody else brought in a Toto song, and somebody brought in you know, a Cat Stevens song. It was really just anything, which I love that thing, that it could just be anything that anybody wanted to, um, to bring to the table. We would learn it, kind of put it into the style of the band, and um, we would just jam on it and have a good time. Um, so it wasn't like that serious of a thing. It was really just kind of get together with friends and do a garage, garage band, kind of jam out and have a good time. But I think that's kind of sowed the seeds for obviously knowing how great it feels to play with other people and just, you know, be in a group and rehearse every week or just, you know, have that sort of connection with other people. Now, before you went to college, did you have a band at home? Um, I think that I was, I was a pretty introverted and shy guy, so I was kind of worried a lot of times about playing with other people. I did have, like, a band I played with when I was in, in high school. Like, I was in, like, the concert band, and I played trombone in there. And I think that was, like, the first thing that got me into music. Hmm. And then I also played in the jazz band in my senior year of high school. And again, it was just sort of this, this experience of playing guitar with other people that was just so much fun and made me, you know, I'm playing on stage as well, that made me want to keep doing it. So guitar with the jazz band? Yes, that's right. And trombone with? It was like a concert, you know, we play classical music, the, just like uh, any high school band, you know, you can think of. So you're well-rounded with different genres and things. I, I, I'd like to think so, I guess, um, that uh, I haven't played trombone in years, but again, it was just that aspect of kind of playing with other people. But there, I think there's a lot of things that you kind of learn from playing different styles of music. For example, uh, playing in that kind of band, uh, like a concert band, you know, need to know how to read music and understand musical nomenclature, and I think it gives you different ideas for rhythms and beats and things like that that aren't really conventional to somebody who listens to only one thing, like somebody who only listens to rock music wouldn't really have exposure to those things. Fascinating. Yeah. So what direction are you taking the new entity now? And you're kind of a duo. Yeah, that's right. Um, I've been playing with my friend Connor Rice, and he was also one of the bandmates in Big Screen Radio. And um, after we went our separate ways with Big Screen Radio, I hit him up to uh, be part of the new group. And so the new thing is really, um, it's a little bit of a departure from that kind of hard rock sound. Um, because as much fun as that was, uh, I've sort of been getting you know, influenced by different things uh, lately. It's kind of more along the lines of folk rock. And um, there's some elements of alternative rock. And um, there's still, you know, elements of hard rock and things like that. That's sort of just like part of my DNA at, the, at this point, I feel like. But um, there's also elements, you know, that are drawn from melodies and sensibilities that come from pop music and trying to find ways to make things, you know, just pleasant to listen to. Um, so I'm trying to, you know, blend all those things together and find a good sound. So if you don't have a favorite as a guitarist, do you have like a top five or a top ten? How is, how is that with you? What is? I, de I definitely... That is a question that I definitely think about a lot, but I, I think, you know, going back to my roots, you know, number one for me, I, I'd say like number three, it's, top three was always like Eddie Van Halen, um, Eric Clapton as for his blues playing, um, and then uh, Steve Vai 
as well was a guy for me. Just that uh, virtuo virtuoso style of shredding. That was something that I would just like sit and listen to with my ear to the record when I was in high school and just trying to get all those licks down and you know trying to figure out what scales he's using, where he's going with it. Um, but yeah, I always think of those as my top three. And there's some different guys that I've started listening to lately. Like I've been very into like John Mayer lately. Again, talking about pop music and things like that. And it's amazing how he takes his sensibilities for blues music, and he has very deep-rooted um, sensibilities in blues music, and uses them to inform music that he's trying to make accessible to a lot of people, and um, trying to get, um, you know, on top 40 and stuff like that. So it's very interesting to see how people approach, you know, how you can take a blues sort of mentality and apply it to a different genre, because there's things you can take from every genre and apply them to whatever. Two of my favorite solos are uh, Ricky Don't Lose That Number, mm -hmm. Steely Dan, you know it? Yeah, yep, absolutely. The Boston guy, Jeff Baxter. Okay, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, so Baxter's, um, that's brilliant, and I think it's an ode to um, Rick Derringer. Okay. Ricky Don't Lose That Number, so... Um, right, right, okay. I guess he wouldn't play or something, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it's a great solo, and, and yeah. then Eddie Van Halen with Beat It. Absolutely, It's Legendary. one of the great... And how it was recorded. I think they shipped the tape to his house. He did it at his house. I didn't know that. That's amazing. I, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because it's been a long time. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I was working with Jimmy Miller, it was 86. So that was like, what, 33 years ago? Mm -hmm. So you weren't around <laughs> when I was working with the Stones producer. It's kind of scary for me. <laughs> you know, I was at A&R meetings and you weren't born yet. Yeah. Well, it's amazing to hear about all the incredible experiences you've had with all these characters. I love hearing your stories. Uh, there's just so many. And so... Um, I've been blessed in that regard, but I wanted to know if you like Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix was, again, an amazing influence, and I think that there's always this funny story that people uh, hear about him coming to jam. I think it was when Eric Clapton was still with Cream, and he just got on before um, Eric Clapton was going up, and he just jammed with the band, and then Eric Clapton heard him and then refused to go on stage afterwards. He said, I'm not playing after that guy is going on. Uh, he, he's, like, too good. There's a lot of urban legends, like, uh, that that Pete Townsend and Eric was saying, this guy's going to put us out of business. And, you know. Right, right, absolutely. And um, I guess, yeah, they're all stories, but, you know, he's an amazing guitar player and, again, heavily influenced by the blues and um, I was a big fan, big fan of his work. I was driving in and I was hearing While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which is Eric Clapton playing absolutely. with the Beatles. Yeah, absolutely. And you can hear the Clapton sound. Mm -hmm. And you know about the trade-off, right? You know where George played on a Cream record. Yeah, yeah, uh, on, on Badge. I love Badge. Badge is an amazing song. Yeah, it is. And I love, um, hear, I, I love when, uh, hearing live videos of Eric Clapton playing it now and just almost hearing how the song has kind of in, evolved and uh, his band now, he puts in like different instruments, saxophones and things like that. And I think it's a tribute to that song, how easy it is to jam on it and where you can kind of take that melody. So um, Hendrix died and part of the, topic of 2019 for visual radio is the opioid crisis because it's all around us. I was telling you before the camera, I would walk down the street at Chet's last call and see my colleagues and some friends from the 70s walking like zombies. I thought I was living in Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> and I found out later they were using heroin. It's unbelievable. But like I said to you, in the, the days of Hendrix and Joplin, heroin in the days of the 80s when the heroin hit the Boston scene hard. I even know the prices now. I, you know, um, I wanted to write my book, Drugs Ruined Me, and I never took any. Hmm. Wow. Drugs Ruined Me, and I never took any. I mean, these yeah. people around me that I was dealing with were all insanely into lethal drugs. Uh, so, uh, you know, one colleague of mine would buy heroin, and, I, and I, it was like a, it was so high tech, it was like a little cigarette package. Wow. The little bag of heroin had like a skull and crossbones, and it was called Murder. <laughs> One brand was called Death. So, like, Ma instead of Marlboro, it's called Murder. I mean, it's like the dealers were actually stamping stuff on it, almost telling you how bad yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. It's like the Surgeon General warning on the cigarette packs. <laughs> yeah, but it was like a joke, but it was no joke. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm in the Rainbow Club in California. So, we're out in LA, and I'm with my dear friend Jojo Lane, and with this investor we had. Uh, he was a musician, uh, he had a record out of. A well-known record at the time. And then uh, a friend of mine borrows the keys to the car, and I'm like, this is kind of odd. Had f heroin f flown in FedEx. Oh, my God. Picks up the heroin and is at the table with us and then collapses at the table. And I'm like, 
this is not good. <laughs> we had landed a deal with Motown Records. Yeah. So I flew us all out to go and have dinner with Motown. Yeah. JoJo had managed a band. So one of the people involved did this little stunt. And I didn't want to sign this band anyways. I, we were working with Buddy Guy. Oh, wow. We should have put Buddy Guy on Motown, but I was outvoted. And I learned long ago when you're right and you know you're right, put your foot down and just, we should have done the Buddy Guy project on Motown. Mm -hmm. It would have been Buddy on Motown. That would have been amazing. Yeah, so, uh, but we're out in L.A. And, and this person fed X's heroin. I mean, it's so illegal. It's unbelievable. This is 1986. The statute of limitations is up and the person's dead, but that's beside the point. <laughs> uh, so, like I said, you, you know, I don't do drugs and, and I'm doing business and this craziness, this insanity is creeping into my world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, and that's my firsthand experience with these people uh, affecting my business. Yeah. And me trying to be, do the right thing and meet with Motown and take them to dinner. And we took uh, Russ Reagan, the legendary Russ Reagan, a and man. We took him to dinner along with the lawyer, Lee Young, great guy. I, 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 Lee said to me at dinner, he goes, you know, I gave Neil Diamond his first check. <laughs> wow. I said, how much, Lee? He goes, one million dollars. Oh, my God. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> you know? not too shabby. No, this is 86, though. This is like, um, and I have those memories back then, but the drug crept in, and the drug would hurt the local musicians at Chet's Last Call mm -hmm. and down in the, um, the Boston Garden area, and I'm seeing them all doing this, and I guess... Uh, they were selling the heroin for like $10 a bag, and they'd buy it in New York, $5 a bag. Oh, my God. So it was a very cheap yeah. poison, a very cheap, cheap toxin. But now, today with this fentanyl thing, a woman I know found fentanyl in her room, and it was her son. And she, um, she picked it up. He goes, oh, give that back to me. And she brought him into the bathroom, and shh. Oh, my God. But he's gone now. And... Um, so it's, um, you, you've got the whole Hendrix, Joplin, Al Wilson thing. They all died in the same month. Mm -hmm. Al Wilson lived in Arlington. Hmm. He was canned heat. You know the song, going up the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's on radio. Yeah, yeah. So he lived up the heights. Wow. And uh, he died under the redwood trees in California, September 1, 1970. So canned heat was supposed to play with Jimi Hendrix and Alvin Lee that night in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. So they put the band on the plane, and the band went over to play this festival, like a mini Woodstock. Wow, yeah. And uh, they find Alan Wilson dead under the redwood trees that he loved out in California, 27 years old. Um, and then the 18th was Jimi Hendrix. So Al Wilson was the first. Jimi died on the 18th, and October 4th was Janis Joplin. So we had three rock stars that all played Woodstock. Mm. And there were different reasons why they're gone. Uh, but uh, the main thing is that they all dabbled in drugs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's like a, a common theme that you hear about with musicians. Um, uh, and it's, you know, crazy. Th you know, I personally have never touched this stuff, but it's crazy to think, you know, what draws, you know, artistic people to that. You know, they think that it will give them something but it's you know like you said it's it's a poison it's a it's a horrible thing well jimmy miller's wife said to me the rolling stones wrote their best songs on my drugs and I'm like, <laughs> well, what a what uh what a badge of honor right you know uh there was a movie called mad dogs and englishmen mm -hmm. uh with leon russell and um joe cocker mm -hmm. it was an amazing movie and it's now there's like a four cd box set and all this so uh Jimmy and Tony Secunda were negotiating with Jimmy's dad. So Jimmy's dad was the great Bill Miller who did uh, Elvis. Elvis's return was Bill Miller and Sid Caesar, show of shows. And all these great, um, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, he had um, Bill Miller's Riviera. And Jimmy's father did that, but Jimmy became a Stones producer without his father's help. So what happened was um, they're negotiating with Bill Miller who hated drugs and... Uh, I guess Geraldine walks in the room, the late Geraldine Miller, and uh, she trips, and she had all these drugs, and they go all over Bill's floor. Oh, and he's no. like, I am not backing Mad Dogs and Englishmen, so oh, they, they lost out on that. Yeah. Um, and so that was, uh, 
That was the good old days. But these are stories. These are all allegations. These are allegedly, these stories were told to me <laughs> mm -hmm. by these people who are long gone and forgotten. And I remember my times with them fondly. So drugs and rock and roll, maybe it inspires songwriters and maybe it can ruin a deal for a movie deal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's good to stay straight, which you are. Yeah. Because, you know, um, like I said, down at the can can tab as opposed to Cantones, mm. which is a club I booked. The Cantab Club Bohemia, um, take me to the river. You were just blazing that night. The, the riffs were incredible. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's just uh, a, such an amazing song to jam on. Um, and it's, uh, it's just blues, you know? It's that, that, that blues kind of, you know, just inspires those feelings. And when you have something really good, like a backing track, you can just kind of get into it and just get into the moment. And that's what you know every band wants, is to have um, some type of, of, of a groove that you can just really lay into and, uh, yeah, get a moment of inspiration out of it, hopefully. Do you and Connor do that song, a duo? We haven't done that song. We are both into really into blues. So there's different um, blues songs that we jam on. We really like... Um, that Cream song, Sunshine of Your Love, and we'll do that song kind of on the solo section, swap back and forth, because he's also a singer and a guitar player. So um, kind of use that to our advantage, having two people um, who are kind of lead guitar players in the band and kind of trade off on the, on the solos. Cream is just amazing. Ginger Baker, what a great drummer. Yeah, it's crazy. Think of, you know, bands like that where it's just so many, so much talent in just three people in there. Ginger wrote the back, word, the back page of my late girlfriend's book, and he put, no sane man would go near her. <laughs> so I guess I'm not sane. Yeah. According to, but Ginger's on my Facebook. God bless you, Ginger. I love Ginger. Yeah, yeah. I met him only once, but he knew who I was because of my Jimmy Miller connection. Okay, Jimmy gotcha. had produced Ginger, so uh, very friendly to me and s put crayon all over his album. <laughs> so you can't even read it. It's an autograph. But, um, you know, Jack Bruce would call the house. Wow. You know, I just like Jack Bruce. Um, yeah, yeah. We only got like a minute left, but um, so JoJo's ex-husband was at my house with his girlfriend, who was Helen Grant, Peter Grant's daughter from uh -huh. Led Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the phone's ringing, and it's like, hi, this is Peter Grant. Is Helen there? And I said, I have to be unprofessional for a second, sir. I said, I'm so honored to talk to you. He goes, really? <laughs> I said, Mr. Grant, please. I'll get your daughter. But it's like, I <laughs> talked to Peter Grant before he died. You know? Oh, my God, that's amazing. <laughs> he yeah. called the house. Jack Bruce called the house. So it's amazing. Yeah, all those experiences. These people that are gone. Jack is gone, and Peter's gone, and it's like, and Jimmy's gone, and JoJo's gone, but I, I love them all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I got to at least talk to them. Yeah. And I got to talk to you tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm honored to be here talking to you as well. Isn't it fun? And, and yeah, Paul absolutely. Norman's a great director. Yeah, absolutely. Paul's great. And you can see it. I don't. I'm not looking at the screen because I just want to have a good show. No, he's doing a fantastic job. I can see it right here, right yeah. in front of me. <laughs> Superb. And uh, you're the first on-air guest. We had a friend of mine, Kate, uh, do an interview before you, but that hasn't aired. That's not going to air. So you're the first guest that will air since Joe Perry. Awesome. We love you, Joe and Billy. Thank you very much for uh, uh, being my uh, my other show. And we're starting the new year, and it's uh, Vikram Agawal. Thank you so much, Joe. Of American Gravity? That's right. That's All right. Thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We love WCAT. 